Hello everybody and welcome back to the second part of our event this morning. I'm delighted to say that so far over 450 have joined us online. Um, of course, while it would be fantastic if we could all be meeting in person, I think it's safe to say that we wouldn't have been able to have so many people joining if this had been a physical event. So uh, thank you again to everyone for joining and fantastic to have so many people um, joining this event today. Can I just give a couple of quick reminders? Um, firstly, when you're on asking the questions through the Q&A function, if you are able to include your name um, and institution or, or where you're asking the question from, then I think that gives some really helpful context um, to the question for, for other members of the audience. Um, and we will, of course, read that out if you do include it in, in the Q&A. That said, if you don't want to include that information, that's absolutely fine and we can ask questions anonymously as we have been doing. Um, also, we've had quite a lot of questions coming through the chat uh, function rather than the Q&A. So just when you're asking a question, if you can select that Q&A icon rather than the chat icon, which is next to it, um, then that will avoid uh, any questions being missed. Uh, again, we'll try and answer as many questions as we possibly can, but we might not be able to get to all of them. And certainly we had lots of fantastic questions in the last session and we weren't able to answer all of them, um, but we'll get through as many as possible. Okay, I would now like to welcome back our Chief Executive, Nicola Dandridge, to introduce the second half of this event. Thanks, Ed. And it's now time to hear from our two keynote speakers, uh, Catherine Ross and Philip Auger, who are going to be talking about what's the point of uh, regulation. And we're then going to hear contributions from Hilary Jebia Babio and Julia Buckingham before we move on to a panel discussion, uh, which is going to be looking at uh, who makes the rules and principles versus rules-based regulation. But our first keynote, spe keynote speaker is Catherine, Catherine Ross, who is Group Regulatory Affairs Director at BT Group. Uh, Catherine has a very distinguished career as a regulator and as a competition economist. She's worked across a number of different sectors advising on regulatory and competition issues, including four years as Chief Executive of off what. Um, the full biographical details are on the events page on our website, so I won't provide further details now because we're really interested to hear from you. Catherine, over to you. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Nicola. Thank you for having me and thank you for organising such an excellent uh, series of events. Re really good stuff. Um, yes, what is the point of regulation? Uh, a jolly good question and, and one that an awful lot of people, both in regulators and, and indeed among regulated uh, entities, uh, ask a lot of the time. Um, I think on the basis of, of my experience, I, I'd say there were sort of two common themes that exist wherever uh, you observe regulation. Uh, one of those themes is around the existence of some imbalance of power, uh, you know, so, some, some sort of relationship where one side has the ability, the incentive to act in, the, in, in a way that is not entirely aligned with the interests of the other side of the relationship. Uh, and that other side of the relationship doesn't have the power effectively uh, to, to push back. Uh, and in the sort of sectors that I'm used to, to regulating in, that's usually economic market power, but it doesn't have to be economic market power. It, it might be things like, uh, you know, information asymmetry. It might be things in relation to, to things like product safety and standards, but there has to be that asymmetry, that imbalance of power. And then the second thing is that society has to care about that imbalance. Um, the people who are less empowered, disadvantaged in that relationship have to be uh, a group uh, of people that we care about as a, as a society. And the services in relation to which they have that imbalance of power also have to be important uh, for society. And when you get those two features, you quite often see uh, regulation. But I think this, um, this idea of, of the point of regulation being to address that imbalance of power tells us something you know, quite quite significant. Um, there are different ways in which regulation can approach this question of addressing balance of power. So one way in which, which that, that can be approached is, is I would say quite sort of static. Uh, and in economic regulatory context, it often hinges around the debate about prices. Uh, and often you end up in a debate that says, lower prices are good for the consumer uh, and higher prices are good for the producer. 
Um, so it's almost as simple as balancing interest by taking money off one group and giving it to, to, to another. Um, frankly, I'd argue that is a very second best view of what regulation can achieve. It's very static. It's very zero sum game. A benefit for one side of the relationship has to be a disbenefit uh, for the other. Um, and, and the sort of thing that I would prefer to see, and I think when, when regulation works best, uh, is where it creates an alignment, it creates a framework that enables the interests of one side of the relationship to become better aligned uh, with the interests of the other side of that relationship. So it creates a win-win situation. The regulated entity does well when it's serving better uh, the interests of, of those uh, that, it, that it serves who would otherwise be, be, be disadvantaged. Um, and that, I think, that view of regulation as, as a set of tools to achieve alignment I think, again, it, it's quite significant in terms of what it's telling us about how that relationship works. And I think one of the things it tells us most, uh, and I was interested in the debate that you were having with, with Michael earlier on, um, is that regulation cannot be static because the interests of customers, the interests of society uh, in respect of those regulated services, that's not static. They change, they evolve uh, over time. And also the risks and opportunities around better delivering in line with those interests, they're also changing uh, over time. And I completely accept, and it sounds like you've been having this debate in spades, I completely accept um, that that is often quite a difficult message uh, for companies, for entities that are regulated to hear. Um, there is quite a school of thought, and if I had a pound for every time I'd heard this, I, I wouldn't be working anymore, uh, that says that you know, the job of the regulator is to set the rules, and if you set the rules, then we can all be clear about what we need to do, uh, and, that, and that's, that's a happy world. Uh, and up to a point that's true, because obviously you, you are trying to influence behaviour as a regulator, so you do need to be clear uh, about uh, what it is uh, people need to do and what, what good looks like, but it can't be static. You know, it's less about rules uh, than it is about principles and, and, and even more about an iterative conversation, a sort of joint exercise in learning and discovery about what works, what doesn't work and what we're all trying to achieve. Um, and in that, that sort of spirit, I did, I did want to, to use my remaining time to throw out a few things uh, that I sort of pick up in, 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 in all sorts of regulated debates across a wide variety of sectors at the moment. Some things that are prompting a lot of regulators uh, to think about how uh, the way in which they regulate uh, perhaps needs to evolve uh, to take account of those changing risks and opportunities for better alignment of interests. Um, one really obvious one, and I'm not just saying this because I, I work for BT, uh, is around this idea of technological change. Um, you know, you mentioned earlier on, Nicola, the idea that, that the pandemic has, has, has featured very large in, in, in the last 12 months. Absolutely. One of the things I think that has, has, has meant is an acceleration of technological change. Uh, you know, all sorts of entities have had to use the opportunities of changing technology to deliver services in very different ways. Um, that, that can be good, it can be bad, it can advantage some groups, it can disadvantage others. Regulators need to think about what that means. Changing technologies can also fundamentally change the economics of service provision, that matters as well. And again, it, it prompts a re-evaluation. Um, and also technology is changing the regulatory toolkit itself as well. It, it, creates new opportunities for regulators uh, to do things in different ways. So for example, lots of regulators now are using things like social media scraping to find out more about what people want from their sector. Uh, big data and machine learning are prevalent, for example, in competition regulation uh, increasingly. So technological change, what one thing that is prompting that, that re-evaluation. Another one, and it's a little bit linked with that, is this whole idea of public engagement. You know, way back 20 years ago when I started in regulators, I think regulators were guilty of thinking, well, you know, we as the regulator know what's in the best interest of customers and society. We should just be allowed to get on and, 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 and deliver that. And I just don't think that's, that's legitimate uh, anymore. Uh, and I think it's incumbent on all regulators to appreciate the heterogeneity of society, the dynamism of changing expectations over time and create processes uh, that help connect service providers with those they serve in a, in a much more dynamic way. So this whole question of public engagement, I think is huge. There is a perennial uh, issue, uh, never has gone away really about the relationship between regulators and policymakers. Uh, but I think right now, 
you know, the nature of the transformation that is going in, going on across the UK economy and society means that regulated sectors, which almost by definition are politically salient, are sectors that policymakers have a lot to say about. Uh, that's fine, but it does prompt again a re-evaluation of the relationship between the independent regulator, independence remains important, uh, and policymakers that have that democratic legitimacy. And then the final point uh, I just want to throw out there is, is actually I think the breadth and pace of change itself uh, is causing a bit of re-evaluation uh, of, of the way in which, which regulation works. Traditional regulatory processes can often involve a time lag of, of many years actually between something happening in the market, the regulator spotting that it's happening, developing some policy ideas, consulting on those, developing a methodology, consulting on those, and then implementing it. And that just doesn't cut it anymore. It, it, it's too long, it's too linear, it's too waterfall. Um, so one of the challenges facing a lot of regulators is, is how to be more anticipatory in nature, how to look forward uh, and how to guide the sector that they regulate uh, towards uh, where we, we need it to be. Uh, and one of the things I do outside BT is I chair something for government called the Regulatory Horizons Council. And one of the things we're doing there is we're trying to sort of think about the impact of technological innovation uh, on regulation and help regulators look into the horizon uh, and, and adapt their toolkit much more proactively. So, so fourth things I think to think about in terms of uh, evolving regulation and I'm sure we'll pick up on some of them later on in the discussion. Thank you. Thank you Catherine that is a fantastic presentation so much in there I'm glad you picked up on public engagement because it's something we want to think more about over the course of the next year and I loved your reference to regulation as a set of tools to achieve alignment it doesn't feel like that down on the shop floor well, um, absolutely what we should be aiming for. Um, Thank you, Catherine. We're going to move on now to our next speaker, Philip uh, Auger, who will be known to many of you as an author and former investment banker who's been writing about the challenges of modern capitalism and banking for 20 years. Um, Philip has held a number of advisory and non-executive roles in the public and private sectors. However, it's likely that he will be most known to this audience as the chair of the panel that reviewed post-18 education for, for the government back in 1819. Though I should add that Philip's not talking to us today uh, in that capacity, but in his personal capacity. Um, Philip, a big welcome. Look forward to hearing from you. Thank you uh, very much, Nicola, and uh, good morning to everyone. Thank you very much for inviting me along to this. Um, I was very interested um, by Michael's uh, introductory remarks, actually. Um, and uh, in particular, the way he, he outlined the, the history of the, OA, of the OFS. And he started it in 2011 with the, uh, the introduction of tuition fees into, you, in, into higher education, and then developed that with the lifting of the numbers cap in, in, in 2013, and that brings us into effectively the marketization of, of HE. And so I'd like to start uh, these few remarks by talking a bit about markets. I've worked in markets for pretty much all of the, uh, all of the 40 years I've been working, 20 years as, uh, as, uh, as, as Nicola said, uh, as, a, as a market participant in markets in the financial services sector. And then for the last 20 years, uh, writing about markets, uh, a bit about financial services markets, but other markets too. And there, it's been an interesting sort of 40 years to be working really, because it started out as the age of, of, the, of the market, the age of the free market. Actually, I've called it elsewhere, the age of the very free market to begin with. This was the age when people believed that business and customers and society would be best served if governments and indeed regulators stood back and let market forces and competition rip. That period probably ended in 2008 with the, with the great financial crisis. Um, markets had overshot. Management had taken excessive risks. Customers hadn't been protected. Uh, society ha hadn't been protected. And we moved then in 2008 into what I think we can think of as the managed market, uh, a more regulated market, a more, a more responsible use of market forces where uh, actors recognize the importance of competition, uh, the 
the importance of responding to market forces, but where governments and regulators see the need to intervene more to control the excesses. And that's the perspective I bring to um, regulation in, in higher education, because in a sense, you've been, you've been through some of this yourselves. The time from 2011 with tuition fees, the lifting of the numbers cap in 2013, right through to the start of the OFS in 2018. That period one could see, if you like, as the age of the free market, indeed the very free market. And now the OFS comes in and you have, I think you're now in at the age of the regulated market. HE wasn't like banking. Um, the institutions, the universities have a, a greater sense of, of public good, a sense of responsibility, a sense of the public benefit. But there, are, there is nonetheless a, a, an element of that free market in, in everyone's behavior. So let me just turn briefly to the market participants, the buyers of the product, effectively the students who are going to university and the sellers of the product, effectively the, the, HE, um, the HE providers. And controlling that dial, controlling that relationship, rather as Catherine has just said, actually, I think is, is in fact the, the task of the one of the tasks of the regulator. The, and it's a tricky one because the buyers themselves, the students, um, are, it, it's a difficult one to, to, to measure value. It's, an, it's what the economists call a, a classic experience good. Um, where it's to do with, as Michael outlined, the quality of the teaching, the, the campus experience, what kind of person you become when you leave, what you learn, the kind of thinking that you learn. There, there, is, all of the, there is all of that, but there is also um, where it leads you. And I think it's, uh, it's important that, I mean, not necessarily that everyone gets a very well-paid job, but ideally that if you want one, and not everyone does want one, you get, a, you get graduate type employment. And it's difficult for, for students to, 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 to weigh that up while, while they're actually there. So I think anything that the regulator can do uh, to help the, uh, the, the buyers in this sense, the, the, the students to, to understand that very rounded picture um, is, is beneficial and, and very, very important. I just want to turn a little bit now to, um, to kind of the other side of the equation, really, the sellers, the, the sellers of the product, the providers, the, the, the universities. Um, and it's, it's a tricky situation for them because if actually, if you increase tuition fees uh, rapidly as, as occurred in the, in, the, in, in the 20 teens, and if you then lift the numbers cap, there is potential incentive to, to grow. And um, there, there have been signals from government in the last decade that actually that's, that's the right thing to do. But it's very important um, to, to grow responsibly. It's very important to not to take excessive financial risk. It's very important to ensure that uh, while numbers are coming in, you are delivering the kind of product that delivers what your customers want, not just in the short term, but in the long in the long term and i also so therefore i also uh, think that that is a very legitimate thing for the ofs to look at we are in the age of the managed market in he we might not we might like it we might not like it but that is that is where we are and to address this this potential tension between the buyer and the seller it, it seems to me that the regulator has a very important place to, to, to have in that. I think it's right that the approach should be principle-based rather than, than rules-based, but just a word of warning. And, and um, I know that Nicola and Michael and, and, and probably Catherine too will be aware of this. There is always the risk of regulatory capture. That can be very direct regulatory capture where the regulator and the regulated just simply become too close. Or it can be in another way where the, the regulated sector lobbies effectively behind the scenes for the regulator's powers to be weakened. Um, I don't think there is a risk of either of that at the moment. I've been very um, encouraged actually by 
the, the, the constructive approach that you UK have taken to this and other issues in, in recent years. But those I think, that I think is just my kind of final word of warning really, just be careful of regulatory capture as you go about this very tricky task of managing the balance between the buyer and the seller of an experience good where it can take many years for the value of that experience to emerge. Nicola, thank you. Thank you very much, Philip. That's a fantastic um, perspective through the, the broader policy, political, social lens of what it is we're trying to do. So thank you very much indeed, uh, Philip. We're going to be hearing from both Catherine and Philip again during the panel discussion, uh, but we're going to move on now to uh, two short contributions from Hilary Jebia Babio and Professor Julia Buckingham, starting with Hilary first. Hilary is the uh, Vice President Higher Education at the National Union of Students and before taking up that role uh, was Undergraduate Education Officer and Chair of the Widening Participation Network at the University of Bristol Students' Union. Hilary, we're delighted to have you here. Over to you. Thank you so much for having me here and, and as I'm really going to give short remarks, I'm, I'm just going to get straight into it. But um, I think the contributions have been really interesting for me to hear so far because I think in many ways students have had a complicated relationship with the marketized university and, and marketized education and, and as I was thinking and preparing for this short two minute and um, remark that I would give, I, I sort of reflected on how we were looking at it and, and perhaps how we can look at it differently, especially in light of what COVID has exacerbated um, in the sector. And, and um, for me, I think um, quite frankly, um, for so long regulation has been such an obscure and, and confusing place for students um, who, who know and feel that education is a fundamental right and a public good for them. And, and, and in many ways, I, I, I've seen that come through a, a plethora of issues that students have fought for. Um, but I, I think what is really, really important is that when we think about true regulation and, and especially principle and um, based regulation I think it's important that we think about how we can actually democratize education and think about how we can bring students in as our partners and peers in making sure that when we are delivering when we are when we are bringing together education we're doing it in a way that really centers them as, as the center of education and and those who, who depend on education so much and um, and so I wanted to quickly just get onto it and say that if there was one thing that I, I could think about that I would want to see um, from regulation in higher education as a student representative is a flip of the script where rather than government or, or sector bodies or, or even universities sort of being the people that set the agenda, I think students should be the people setting the agenda and, and it should be a partnership approach of students, universities, sector bodies and in, in shaping and implementing that agenda, really thinking about students being at the forefront of that and being the people that are driving the narrative. And, and if we continue to see students as consumers, as these sort of faceless consumers of, of education or, or, or of our sector, I think we will continue to let them down, especially where they feel most vulnerable in this education system. And, and I think if we want to set a culture where students feel seen, heard and engaged with um, and empowered, it, it would only work for us to actually flip the script and, and think of students not as consumers, but actually peers and partners in setting the values and principles we will work on and, and actually thinking about how we can go forward and doing regulation in, in the right way for students to get the most out of their education. So that's my, my short remarks. Fantastic. Thank you, Hilary. I really want to come back to you because I, I, I'm sure I speak on behalf of the OFS to say I absolutely agree that students are not just consumers. I love the idea of peers and partners. The challenge is how do we do that? How do we actually make that work in practice? But let's hold it there because I'm going to come back to you, um, Hilary, when we have the panel discussion and turn now to uh, Professor Julia Buckingham. Julia, Julia is president of UUK and vice chancellor and president of Brunel University in London. Um, Julia's had a huge and successful academic career, published widely in her field, pharmacology. And uh, Julia, we're delighted to have you with us here today. Over to you. Well, thank you very much, Nicola. And it, it's a great pleasure to be here. And it's been a really interesting conversation so far. Um, I've been asked to pinpoint just one thing, which is hard to do, but for me that one thing that I want out of regulation is good collaboration. And to my mind, collaboration is a really critical component of any effective regulatory system, 
and it's collaboration between the regulator and the regulated and collaborator with all the key stakeholders. Now, in my view, the primary purpose of any regulatory system must ultimately be to hold organizations to account. Um, but that alone isn't enough. It's in every stakeholder's interest that the regulation is well done, that the gold standards for excellence are very clearly defined and framed, and that there's a culture of continuous improvement as we reflect on performance, learn from others and address new challenges. I think we're very fortunate in the UK to have a higher education sector that's admired across the globe. That's something to treasure, not something to take for granted. Our regulatory system must protect and strengthen our brand, but of course it must protect the interests of all our students and our other various stakeholders. Those who invest in our students directly or indirectly, employers and others who benefit from the knowledge and skills our students acquire, very importantly and often not mentioned, the PSRBs and others who contribute to the regulatory framework we have to operate in, and of course, future generations of students. And I really believe that all of this will work best if we work together. Now, regulation of the sector must be informed by expert knowledge and understanding of good practice to ensure proportionality, reduce unnecessary cost and bureaucracy, and build both student and public confidence. It must support and encourage good practice to achieve excellence across the full breadth of our students' university experience and ensure that our graduates are well prepared to fulfill their, their personal aspirations, not the ones that we think we should set for them. It must also facilitate innovation, diversity and creativity that's needed to take the sector forward. Of course, the independence of the regulator is sacrosanct, but a regulatory framework that has collaboration good communication, open and honest, constructive dialogue at its heart is a very powerful tool. And that benefits the regulator, the regulated, and the various stakeholders, in particular, our students. Such dialogue should cover the full range of issues the framework covers. From, for example, the work that universities have progressed on student mental health and our work on quality and standards. Dialogue supports clarity around regulatory expectations. It ensures that proposals are workable and that they will achieve their intended impact and it guards against unintended consequences. And if and when there are concerns about actions or effectiveness, our first objection should always be to engage in supportive and constructive dialogue to try and address them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julia. Can I just go back to you first of all, before bringing in questions? Um, you uh, speak um, about collaboration and, and the need to work together. How do you stop that from becoming regulatory capture in the way that Philip talked about? I think it's a question of balance, um, Nicola, like most things. Um, ultimately, the decisions rest with you as the regulator. But I think in developing the ideas and the concepts, that collaboration is absolutely key to develop the really good understanding of what the issues are that we are trying to address. And I think there are many different ways that you can do that. Consultations are fine, but they are very impersonal. Um, I think there are better ways through focus groups, roundtables, et cetera, et cetera, where you have a real dialogue, not just a question and answer and something goes into a survey and you tick a box. Okay, thank you. <laughs> can I go back to Hillary and, um, you set out very coherently and persuasively how students are not just consumers. It would be really good to hear a bit more from you as to how you can see uh, students and indeed the NUS taking advantage of the framework which is there, which has been set up to regulate on behalf of students. Is there some value in the concept of uh, students as consumers, do you think? Fundamentally, I, I don't think so. I think when we think about education, and, and this is something that's personally close to my heart because um, I'm I'm a child of immigrants, I'm a child, um, well, I'm not a child anymore, pay my taxes, but I'm 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 somebody that has grown up from a background that, you know, has I, I know what it means to be underrepresented. I know what it means to to be disempowered in a in a world and in a society that doesn't necessarily benefit you for a variety of reasons. And and the one thing that has 
been a fundamental that my parents, my grandparents, my family ha have seen time and time again is, is a public good and, and has been good for people is education. And I think the more we think about students as consumers, the, the more we take away from the fact that, you know, education is the key that unlocks a lot of the opportunities, the abilities to thrive, the ability to shape people that students mm -hmm. so need. And, and I think that the narrative around consumerism for students often takes away that really human aspect of, of the fact that they're not just going to university to consume education, regurgitate an, an assessment and get a certificate. You know, they too are our partners and peers in that environment. And in the same way they're being taught and they're experiencing university, they're, they're also shaping and teaching in university. And I think once we really forget about this sort of consumer model and even more so that hierarchical model of like student teacher or lecturer student, I think, I think we get to a place where we actually see universities and education education actually and um, be delivered to its full potential to its full purpose as a as a space and a place where people are enriched engaged with and and ultimately are able to to thrive as the people that they want to be in the ways that they want to do that and I think you know consumerism and the way we talk about the marketized higher education sector really really takes away from that fundamental purpose and and principle of education thank you Hilary and um Building on that, there's a question that's come in about um, regulatory capture. I think this is a, a question um, for Philip. How does, uh, how do you think, as a regulator, we should strike the balance between constructive engagement uh, with those we regulate and regulatory capture? Well, it's a it's a it's a it's a really hard one, and I understand um, Julia's point about um, a, con a constructive dialogue and collaboration. Um, but actually, when I hear those words, alarm bells start, alarm bells start to ring in my, in my head, because actually that's, that's how capture begins to, to occur. And actually, uh, I mean, a way, uh, quite a good way to do it. Um, I don't agree with everything that, that Hillary said, but I do think that the that student voice is incredibly important, absolutely essential to have student voice. And so to have the student voice in this dialogue between uh, the regulator and the providers, that's, that's really important. That is one way that you avoid it getting too cozy. I, don't, I, don't, I, I, I get scared about, about too much, you know, you have to be, you know, what is the point of regulation? Well, actually there does have to be a point of regulation. It has to be a sharp point and it has to be, and it has to operate in the interests of actually the student body. Now we want to have the student voice in that, but it, and it, and it should be courteous and yes, constructive and, and yes, collaborative, but actually, you know, you, you, you have to go into that with the right mindset. Thank you, Philip. This is a question uh, for Catherine from um, Phil Berry. Students are one beneficiary of higher education, but there are many more beneficiaries. So how do regulators accommodate the interests of this wider set of stakeholders? Yeah, it's a really, really good point, actually. Um, and it, it is challenging and it, it sort of slightly overlaps a little bit with the previous debate about, about regulatory capture and, and collaboration as well. I think it's really, really important for regulators to go out of their way to hear a diversity of, of view and a diversity of voices and actually bring those, those wider voices into the regulatory conversation. So, you know, for example, um, if, if you're talking about the value that higher education brings, not just to students, but for example, to communities or to industry, um, you know, you, you, you actually have to go and seek those people out and bring them into the conversation and make sure you, you, you hear those, those voices. And, and, you know, as a regulator, you know, you, you've got an incredible responsibility. But what you do is really, really important. And you have tremendous convening power. You really can create conversations. People will want to talk to you. Mm. Um, and so actually, I, I never found it was particularly difficult to get people to engage. What was hard w w was to sort of firstly find the time uh, and, and secondly, to keep reminding myself that uh, you do have to look beyond the usual suspects because there'll be an obvious set of stakeholders who you know you need to talk to and who want to talk to you. And you have to keep widening the conversation. I think if you do that, you get a pretty clear idea about where those other sources of value from the service sit, what people feel about those and how to build those into your regulation. But you do have to make a conscious effort to, to do it because otherwise you'll be sucked in 
um, to, to the sort of the, the obvious conversation, perhaps to the detriment of some of the less obvious conversations. Uh, Nicola, could I just come in and, and build on that a, a second, actually? Um, I mean, I think one of the important things that the OFS has to do is to, and it's building on, on Catherine's point and Hillary's points, you have to be really, really good at investigating and dealing with issues raised by students. That implementation is really essential. Nothing loses the audience more than a complaint being raised and not followed through effectively by the regulator. You have to have the resources and the mindset to do that on behalf of, of the students. Sorry to cut in. Yeah, no, a really helpful point, uh, Philip, and very well made. Um, there's been a lot of questions coming in about regulatory capture, in, interestingly, um, but there's a good angle on it here from Mike Ratcliffe. Um, it's a question as follows. Um, it's important that the regulator isn't captured by the sector, but there is a danger that the regulator can be captured by government, issues such as free speech or low value courses, or a sudden upset with the NSS appear to pass straight from government through OFS out to the sector. My, I wouldn't agree with that, by the way, but anyway, the question is still good. Um, what, uh, what do we think about regulatory capture by government? Philip, can I put that one to you? Yes, um, I mean the government. The government is an important actor in this because we have this. We have this market in education. And we may like it or we may not, but we, as a, as a result of, of 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 government decisions, and the government sort of broadly speaking um, sets the rules. Fortunately, some things are sacrosanct. Academic freedom is 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 one of them. Um, this isn't. You know, this is another place where there has to be a constructive dialogue and. Your, you know, the independence of the regulator is 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 kind of one of one of the very the very basic principles. Yeah, um, Catherine, do you experience similar challenges and questions about regulatory capture by government? Totally, it, it, it's perennial. It goes back to this tension that's inherent in the whole system. That the reason the regulator exists is because this sector matters. Um, if it matters to society, government will have stuff to say about it. So it's just, I'm afraid it just, just comes with the territory. What, what, one thing that I think has happened in other sectors that are regulated, which I think has been a hugely positive development, is that government has uh, given what's referred to as strategic policy steers to the regulator. And, and the idea is that, that the government says once a parliament, here's the stuff that we think on behalf of the society that elected us really matters in this sector. And, and traditionally those things are focused on outcomes and the kind of outcomes that matter to society. So they're not telling the regulator how to do their job, but they are, and I think this is important, a transparent vehicle for the conveyance of legitimate societal concerns manifested through a democratically elected government to the regulator. And then the regulator is required, and this varies according to different sectors, um, to have regard to those or to act in accordance to those or whatever. And then when the regulator goes to, to the select committee to be held to account for its work, one of the things it is routinely asked is, well, how did you take account of what government said mattered? And I think that's been really useful in two ways. One, because it's provided a vehicle for government to say things uh, that probably it would have said anyway, um, you know, in, in the back room, but it provides a transparent vehicle for that. And secondly, it, 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 by virtue of doing that, it slightly puts government in a box. You know, it, it sort of short circuits what, what might otherwise be not very transparent, very fluid conversations that are, where, where government is maybe seeking to influence the regulator in an unhelpful way. And it bounds that in a process with an output and puts some transparency around it. So maybe that's one of the sorts of things that, that the higher education sector could see in future. Thank you. Um, on a different theme, I've got a question for Hillary here from Mike Larkin uh, from Total Equality for Students who asks about widening access. Um, Hilary, do you think reform of examinations and contextual admissions is the way forward? And would more equality of provision and resources be needed to go along with this? So a question about reform of examinations and contextual admissions. What's your views on that? 
Um, so I think it's a good start um, in terms of making sure that students from disadvantaged backgrounds um, are able to access education and, and do that fully. Um, however, I, I think I think there's far like we can go far further to make you know higher education a space where those students, students like me essentially, can feel like they can go there, but not only go there and, and sort of get through university, get your degree, but actually thrive in there. And I think when we think about the provisions needed in place, this is something that's actually been quite close to my heart and I've, I've sort of carried through my time working in this, in this movement, in this sector, is that I, I think often um, we see these students as not being represented in universities or, or not being able to access universities, having low representation. And, and we put in all of these initiatives to get them in. And I, But I think once they're in, um, there has to be a follow through of that provision to make sure that they don't just get to university. And, and I resonate with this feeling quite closely, get through university and sort of survive it. But I think we need to be constantly enabling and empowering them. So at the point at which they graduate from university and leave university, they feel that they've been able to to work and be treated and, and be resourced enough to be on an equitable and equal level with those that are more privileged than them and more those that you know sort of have more resources and 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 the backgrounds and and the the capital to be able to get to the spaces where they want to be much more easily and so I think I think you know, contextual admissions is is a big step forward, but I think there's so much more that we can do. And and I, I think in terms of the regulator and, and thinking about your part in this, I think it's really important that we see that, you know, a lot of the things that we have to put in place often patchworks the fact that some, like in, in a lot of spaces that are deeply embedded inequalities within our education system. And so, you know, in my view, I think it's really important that we don't just look to regulate um, in order to keep the current system sort of surviving and getting through with our sort of patchwork fixes, but we actually look to where, we actually look to see where we can transform and actually, actually you know, so, sort of uproot those inequalities and, and and actually reset why education system looks like who it's for and how we how we deliver it so everybody can truly benefit um from the from the you know educate higher education system that that like you said earlier we are so proud of uh, and hillary we've had exactly this discussion before how do you balance that broader ambition which the nus encapsulates so well with what we do as the office for students which is much more granular in some ways and much more focused and it's a discussion that i guess is going to continue for a long time i've got a question here for julia um joe johnson recently suggested that the future of education is more modular with a move towards people being allowed to drop in and out of education over their lifetimes if this happens and tuition fees increase do you see this as leading to a return to a division between universities and polytechnics? Um, thank you. No, it's a very interesting question. I, I suspect we're looking towards a much broader model of education, and we are increasingly thinking um, not only about the traditional university population of 18 to 21, 22 year olds, but actually a much older population of people who are interested in taking a small number of modules to upskill, reskill. Um, in their employment. And I think that will probably become critically important as we move into the economic recovery from the pandemic, that issue of how we enable people to upskill and reskill in a way that those qualifications are certified, recognizable, is really important. Um, Universities UK did a piece of work on this about two years ago, I think it was now, now um, where we dealt with some suggested models of how it might work and how it might be funded. Um, which I think is very valuable. Something that we want to take. We don't understand enough from them about what they actually want. Do they really want to do a year at university and move off and go somewhere else and then come back and do another year? Do they want to move between universities? We don't really know. Um, but I think if we can develop a system which is flexible, that works for everybody, irrespective of what their background is, to go back to exactly what Hillary was talking about, that will be to the benefit of all of us. And of course, as people get older, they change, they want different things, and they see things differently. Fantastic. Thanks, you, you, you just slightly dropped out there, but I think we, we got right. the, a 
very strong gist of what you were saying. So very helpful. Thank you. Um, there's a question here um, for Philip from Andy Schofield, who's Vice Chancellor at Lancaster University. Are there lessons from other sectors where the value of the experience good, um, which may only be apparent many years after that experience, have been successfully quantified? And I might ask Catherine to answer the same question as well, actually. I'd rather you ask Catherine to answer it first. <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm not letting you off that lightly. Are there, uh, have you got experience? I mean, if the answer is no, that's completely fine. But um, um, any other sectors where experiential good is um, identified? I, I, I can't think of any because normally the term normally the term is used when you get a very a very quick payoff. Actually, yeah. and I think I mean poss possibly the health sector might be one actually, um, and, and and you know where where we have sort of public information to do with. Uh, damages to cigarette smoking and drink driving and wearing seat belts but um uh, it's a great it's a great question um i'd like written notice of these things in the future so over to fair enough it was specifically <laughs> asked of you philip which is why i asked you first of all catherine can you help us about other sectors where uh, the value of the experience good only comes out is only manifest many years after their experience God, uh, where, where to start? I mean, I, I don't, I don't have any great examples of where it's been measured. Um, it's, it's, it's really difficult. But, but, gee, I mean, it's not a unique challenge. Uh, I mean, regulated sectors are, are stuffed full of these things. And, and in fact, you know, with, with my day job, you know, obviously I, I work for BT. One of the things we're doing at the moment is we're trying to sell people fibre broadband. Well, that's an experience. Good. You don't know whether you need it or not until you've got it. Um, you know. We're faced with this challenge in a commercial world every day. What, what, what? Well, a couple of things I would say though. I mean, the first is just because something cannot be accurately measured does not mean we shouldn't pay attention to it. Mm. Um, so I think that's just an important thing to, to bear in mind. Maybe, maybe it's not perfect. Maybe we can't do a great job at measuring it, but it still matters. And then the second thing is in in, in many other, and I will use the term market here, but in many other markets where actually things are experienced goods. One of the things that, that regulators have paid quite a bit of attention to has been improving the feedback loop. So how do people who have actually experienced that uh, get to easily, quickly, with relatively low cost, share their experience, probably in a qualitative sense, with people who have not yet experienced that good so that they can then learn and you short circuit the feedback loop and you, you get a better, more effective market. It's not perfect, but, but it does matter and there are things that can be done to improve it. Um, Catherine, can I ask you another question, actually, which has been put um, to you, and I, I'm really interested in this as well. Well, I'm interested in all these questions, but this one is quite specific, um, and it refers to you having talked about regulation being responsive to the external environment. Can you talk more about what that means in practice and how can regulators adapt quickly to the changing external environment? Yeah, we, we, we've touched on this, I think, in a number of different debates that we, we, we've had this morning. Um, and one concept we haven't made explicit, but I think is, is kind of implicit in a lot of those conversations, is this idea that what regulators are doing is actually really, you know, playing their part in a system. Uh, and there is a lot of scope, I think, for regulators to use their convening power and use their overview of a sector uh, to actually understand how the whole system works together to produce the outcomes that the users and society care about. And it's a little bit the conversation that you were having with, with, with Hillary as well about the fact that, you know, this isn't a linear thing where, where, where the, the higher education institutions produce a service that is then consumed by the students. The students are an interactive part of how that service is provided. It affects their experience. So they are part of the system. So I think on one level, this idea of regulators responding to the external environment really collapses to an idea that regulators should, should pay attention to understand and work with all the different elements in the system that will then combine uh, to create the outcomes uh, that, that customers, users, society, citizens uh, care about. How best to do that? Um, yeah, I mean, it goes back to this, this thing that I was talking about before. I think a lot of regulators um, that I know have really had a wake up call uh, on, on this in the, in the past past few years, where I think a lot of a lot of regulators have felt as though they were sort of condemned to regulate through the rear view mirror. Um, 
by the fact that you know we're very you know, so regulators we like evidence we like evidence-based regulation that, that's important but obviously evidence relates to the past it takes time to analyze it it, it takes time to turn that into uh, some ideas we then consult on them uh, and then we put some stuff out and all that can take years and years and years and there are ways of short-circuiting that so so for example you know taking a more agile iterative approach uh, you know m making more effective use of different elements in the system and setting those up so that they can process information, learn, and then share that learning in with the regulator rather than the regulator sucking everything up itself and then sort of spitting out what it thinks and, and, and sort of you know, taking charge of, of the whole process. But it, it's a very different way of interacting with the whole system uh, and empowering and using your power as the regulator to empower other parts of the system to uh, you know, make use of the information that's available to them, come up with ideas, feed them into you, then iterate them around, decide what you've learned collectively, and then move on with the next iteration. It's, it's quite a different way of doing things, but I think increasingly a lot of regulators are trying to do that. Yeah. No, that's really helpful. Thank you. Um, a, a different sort of question coming in, um, again for Philip, um, and uh, it relates to your having identified the buyer of higher education as a student. Um, and the question which comes from Helen Carasso at the University of Oxford is this, um, isn't the basis of the loan system that the government is also a buyer? And if we forget this, is there a risk that we then ignore the public good element of higher education, in which case the market that's being regulated is viewed as purely commercial? I mean, that's another very good question. I, I finally thought of the answer to the previous question. Probably that's for another. <laughs> that's for another. Yes, you can answer that one too if you want. But <laughs> first of all, public good and the government as a buyer. It 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 it, it clearly is, and um, that sort of that that ties back, doesn't it? Actually, to an earlier an earlier question about the role that. Um, the government, and I thought Catherine put it very well, democratically elected government, um, has has to play in this. It's a it's a it's a very rounded um, sort of model that we, that we're having to contemplate, or a multi-dimensional model, really. What ha what happens while you're at university? What happens after you've gone to university? And then standing back, how does this play out for society at large? Are we producing the right kind of person? How does this play out for the economy? Uh, are we producing the, the kind of people that the public sector wants, that, that, that industry wants? It's an extremely sort of com complex, um, potentially unstable kind of set, of set of considerations. And, you know, we have to hope that it's built on, on so the solid foundations of a democratic government, um, an independent regulator, institutions which operate in the public good, which they do, and responsible and responsible students. It's 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 something like that. Can I? Sorry, Philip. Do you want to say anything about other sectors before I move oh, on? I was just thinking about the tobacco industry, actually, uh, which I mentioned at the time, where um, where government and regulators, government and the health sector, actually say this isn't good for you. The manufacturers say, yeah, it's fine. They lobby furiously. They they do. it's an, it's quite an interesting example. You could also think about. Um, about gyms as well, where it hurts at the time, but you try and make the experience as good as possible, and it works in the long run. That's for a, that's going to be a very good article at some point. Look forward to it. Um, can I put this question about um, the government as a buyer and the public good to um, Hillary as well? Um, Hillary, um, what's your sense of the government interest in higher education, and how does that relate to the student interest? That's a that is a really really good question. Um, I think I think there's a few things that come to mind when I think about this. I think first of all, um, a democratically elected government um, has a responsibility to the people that democratically elected them. And so I think uh, as a starting point of that principle, I think the starting interest for government should be able to um, should be to get students to education in a way that they are fully able to participate and benefit from that education in its fullness. And I, 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 I don't necessarily agree with everything that Philip said, but I, I think it's important that when we think about the purpose of education, I think that's what it really comes down to and mm -hmm. um, when I really think about it when we think about the purpose of education is education a means by which we are creating workers or creating people um, in, in an archetype that we want to go into society and contribute in the ways that we want or 
is education a space where we are inviting students to to unlock their potential to unlock the things that they are truly passionate about and to to get them to be the innovators of our society the people that come and continue to let our society be organic and grow and change as they go into it as passionate passionate creative you know valid full people in society um, and not just sort of a, a cookie cutter of what sort of the government of that day's aims might be but instead um, a government like enabling those students to go into society in the ways that they feel the most themselves the most empowered and the most seen and heard and and I think about that especially for students from disadvantaged backgrounds and um, who often you know like are are, are already like years and years and years behind in terms of the progress that has been made for them um, to be able to thrive in the society we have today. And so um, I hope that answers the question. I don't know if that was vague, but but that's sort of what comes to mind um, reflecting on, on that. No, that's really helpful. Thank you, Hilary. And um, there's a question- Can I come in there, Nicola, just, for, just for a moment? Because I, I think that really goes to the heart of what we mean about the value of an education. And in this discussion dialogue we've been having now for several years about the value of a degree, I think this is exactly what it's about, is what is the broad value of a higher education to our society and to the individual. And surely when we're thinking about value, we've got to look at all of those parameters to really, really get that benefit. Yeah. Julia, there's a question, a, a spe more specific question for you, actually. So while I've got you, why don't I put it to you? Okay. Um, it's from Christopher Appleby. Uh, the introduction of regulation to protect student interests in the sector has been a welcome development to ensure that quality and participation are driven forward. How do you see the balance of protecting against grade inflation and providing high quality outcomes for students? Um, I think that, that, that's a good question. And I think we all welcome regulation in the system. I don't think there's anybody who doesn't. And I think it's very important to say it from the sector's perspective how much we do value it. Um, I think grade inflation is something that the sector has taken very seriously, as you know, we've done a lot of work on it. Um, I think we have put guidance in place to encourage universities to behave in a responsible way. Um, it's critically important that the degree is worth what it should be worth. But we must also recognize that as we improve education, if we maintain current standards, the chances are we will see some degree inflation. And if we, for example, deal with the attainment gap, which we're all very, very worried about, um, an inevitable consequence of that will be degree inflation, which I think we should celebrate because that's actually what we're trying to achieve. Um, but it is making sure that we have processes in, in place to maintain the standards of what we are offering. And that to me is critically important. And we actually never do the really controlled experiment. Um, and I don't suppose it's possible even to do it which is to use the same exam papers as we used um, five years ago, having sort of taught the same course and see what the outcome is, but you can never do the controlled experiment, of course. There's, um, I'm trying to get through all these questions now and uh, I'm not gonna be able to do them all justice, but there's, a, there's a, a bunch of questions about relationship between the regulator and regulatee and how um, the relationship can be developed to ensure that the regulatee universities and colleges can feel confident to seek advice and guidance from the regulator. Um, and there's a related question from Paul Lazell in, at Royal Vice Chancellor at Royal Holloway, um, asking about how do you ensure that the regulator has the knowledge and expertise to fully model proposed interventions? How does this work with other regulators? So can I go to you, Catherine? How do you, how do you get this balance right between making sure that the regulated can see can seek advice and guidance, and also make sure that knowledge um, and of consequences of interventions is uh, secure. Yeah, I, I, I've seen this from, from both sides of the table uh, as, as a regulator and, and, and now uh, working for BT, which is obviously highly regulated by, by, by Ofcom. And it is tricky because, you know, on the one hand, the regulator rightly wants and needs that constructive dialogue with the regulated sectors. It needs to gather intelligence. It needs to have a conversation about what's working and what isn't working. Uh, it may even need to do some co-creation at some point. That, that's fine. But equally, as, as Philip was saying earlier on, 
you know, every regulator has, has the pointy end of the stick uh, that occasionally it will need to use. Um, and I think it, 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 is, it is a balance. And I think it requires a level of maturity on both sides. You know, the regulator cannot relinquish it, it's, its pointy stick. It, it wouldn't work if it, if it did, and it shouldn't pretend that it, that it is relinquishing that. Um, and equally, it's incumbent on the regulated entities to realize that, that you know, if, if the regulator does switch from a co-creation mode to pointy stick mode, doesn't mean they're being disingenuous. It doesn't mean that they didn't want to have a genuinely co-creative collaborative conversation over here, but this is another part of their toolkit and, and, and they have to use it. it. It does require a high degree of, of maturity. It also requires, I think, quite a high degree of trust because you know, regulated entities and regulators will not always agree that this is not going to happen. So you have to have the kind of relationship where, you know, it's okay to disagree and you can still work collaboratively and, and, and constructively together. And, um, you know, I've certainly experienced that in, in places where I've worked, where, where that hasn't been the case. And it requires quite a bit of investment over quite a bit of time to, to restore that. So there, there's no magic bullet. Uh, it, it, but the key is, is really about transparency, open and constructive di dialogue and, and maturity. Thank you very much. Um, there's a, a question here, which I think is for Hillary, um, a short question. Um, what should the relationship and what sort of communication should the OFS have with students? Hillary, what do you think the answer is to that? That's a really, really good question. Um, and it's something that I often reflect on just in my job. Um, I think there's a few things. And I think I, I always like to think about this in, in terms of layers of layers of communication, layers of of um, sort of working together. And, and so um, I would be remiss if I didn't say, you know, like students being heard via their student representatives is always going to be something that I will talk about. I think students are, are are, like there are a lot of students and student representatives are, are so crucial in really representing student views to the regulator, to the OFS in the ways that, you know, really affect change and the impactful change that students want to see. And so um, I think it's important that representatives are, are high on that list. But I think in terms of the direct student, and I, I, I think about this, especially in the context of the fact that, you know, we have an NSS review going on and, and there's so much that we're thinking about in terms of students being able to, to relate to the regulator and feedback to the regulator what their experiences are. Um, and I think there's something really, really important, especially now following um, the pandemic about a real personal approach and, and actually um, building on what I've been saying throughout, really looking at students as, as co-producers and partners and peers in the work that we do. And for that to work, we have to be able to, to not only reach out to students and invite them in, but actually when we invite them in, invite them to lead and set the narrative and set the agenda. And then in that way, you can find constructive relationships being made with between the OFS and students in a way where both parties feel equally empowered and, and feel like they have an equitable I and mean, an equal stake of, of education in the ways that they need to. So I hope that I hope that answers that very simple question in a very um, simple way. <laughs> Thank you, Hilary. No, really helpful. I'm going to try and squeeze in two more uh, quick questions, but we're slightly running out of time here now. Question, a uh, penultimate question from Larry Magee. And I think this one is to Julia. Um, students are not aware of what a good experience is. They often expect, accept what a higher education provider delivers. Should we try and outline what a good experience might be and then deliver it to sixth form students? Being one of 100 first year students is very different to being one of 15 students, for example. Julia, what do you well, make I, of that? I think, I think that's a very difficult one because of course our sector is so diverse. And yeah. I think it's really important for prospective students to understand the breadth of the sector and just how diverse it is. So my, my real recommendation to students would be to research very well what the institutions are like that you are thinking of going to. And I think it, it's the responsibility of institutions to make very clear what their offering is to students. Um, the difficulty is making sure that everybody really absorbs that and, and understands what it's like because it is such a change, um, particularly for students who leave from home, it's such a very different experience that it's difficult to define it precisely. And as you, you say, Nicola, it's much easier when there were 15 students in a year than when there are 100 students in a year and different students will perceive things differently. Um, 
quite, 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 quite a challenging one, but I think the more we can do to help students understand before they go to university what the experience is going to be like, the better. I think taster programs are a great idea, taster days, those sorts of things. They all give a feel of what it's like. And now we're much savvier at doing these things virtually. Um, so it's become much more possible. And I, I think some of the open days that students, that it, institutions are putting on now, which are online, because we've got no other way of doing it. I think they are fantastic and you can get a far, far better feel. But I still don't think anything will ever make up for going there, feeling it talking to the students and the students are the people who will tell you what it's like. Um, I think talking to the students and talking to the people who will teach you, have they got the passion for their subject? would be a question I would ask. Fantastic. <laughs> Final question um, from Fen Woolley Gale, a Disabled Students UK. And if possible, I'd like to put it to all four of you and see whether we can get very quick responses. Um, in one sentence, um, regulatory capture poses a particularly acute danger to students from disadvantaged backgrounds because our voices can be easily drowned out if a regulator doesn't prioritise engaging with us. How can a regulator ensure uh, that its requirements uh, for equality and diversity uh, are met and that that engagement takes place? So how can we be responsive to students from disadvantaged backgrounds? Um, Julia, very briefly, can I just start with you? Oh, well, I think, I think it's a very, very good question. Um, and I think, again, it, it goes to having a good framework, which we all understand, as to what the expectations should be for particular, particular groups of, of students. And I think disabilities is a very good one to choose. Of course, it's a very, very wide area. It spans everything from mental health through to um, physical disabilities. But I think have, having an agreed framework and standards which universities adhere to. Um, it's really important that students from every um, group have the same opportunities to succeed at university. And that should be absolutely top of the agenda. Philip, how can we ensure that as a regulator, we engage with um, all students? and dis from disadvantaged backgrounds as well, and from equality backgrounds? I mean, it goes back to something I, I, I said earlier, Nicola, you have to be good enough to listen to the student voice, all students, and if they, if they have legitimate comments, do something about it. It's actually, you know, you're very well intentioned, I know, but it's actually having the, having the resources, the skills, the determination to follow through in these difficult areas. Thank you, Philip. Catherine, how do we engage with, this, with students from disadvantaged backgrounds and with different equality characteristics? Yeah, I, I'd say three, three things. Um, one is process. So you have to have a process that builds in explicitly, consciously diverse voices. And that process has to make it easy for those diverse voices to access it. So that's point one. Point two is that process actually has to be set up in a way that delivers impact. So this isn't about listening, this is actually about doing stuff on the basis of listening. And then I think the third element is, is feedback because actually a, a lot of people from, from disadvantaged uh, groups, a lot of people from more diverse backgrounds, actually you know, one of the barriers is people just don't feel they're gonna be heard. They don't feel it's, it's, it's worth going through the cost and, and actually shouting loud enough. Uh, to get their message through and if you can give them the feedback that those people who have done that and have been heard have actually had an impact you, you stand a better chance of being on that virtuous circle. Thank you and Hilary last word to you. Thank you Um, I think first of all I think this is a really tough thing to do in the context of a marketized higher education system for a variety of reasons that I could probably tell you on Twitter and not take up this time. Um, but I think what the most important thing for me to say is that as a regulator, you have to just make sure that everything you do is inclusive by design. It shouldn't wait until, you know, things are flagged up as affecting groups um, affecting groups in an adverse way. If by, you know, doing your work, you're making sure that things are inclusive by design by, you know, for disabled students, for black students, for students from racialized minorities, things are set up in a way that they inherently benefit it from it and um, then it becomes you know it becomes a lot easier for you to do it but I think in the context of a marketized higher education system that looks at students as consumers this is really really like difficult but I think it's worth um listening and making sure that you are consistently showing yourself as as willing to be able to do the work and do it do it the full way um, and that's what I would say 
Hilary, thank you. That's such a brilliant way of summing up this discussion, that this is really difficult and the way forward is by listening. And I think that's one of the themes, actually, that's run throughout the whole of um, the session uh, this morning. I'm so sorry that I haven't got to everyone's questions. Um, we will uh, reflect on them and take them into account. We've just run out of time. Um, but look, thank you all for putting your questions forward. Um, what I think we've heard today is that um, in the first part, we talked about, uh, Michael talked about our job as a regulator to create the conditions for a, a thriving sector and wanting to leave the sector better than we found it. And I think what we're um, looking to do in um, events such as this is to really define what we think better looks like. What are the outcomes that we expect to see? What does it mean in terms of access and participation, equality and diversity, as we were just talking about? And how can we um, reconcile the competing challenges uh, and yet secure that we are adding considerable benefit to the sector? And then in part two, what a rich discussion, and I don't know where to start in terms of uh, uh, summarizing it, but I think what came over um, really importantly is something Catherine said about the need for regulation to, to evolve and change over time because higher education is so diverse and dynamic, uh, it's not static and we need to adjust and have these sorts of uh, discussions to make sure that um, we're responsive and effective. And um, I think the discussion we had about regulatory capture that Philip articulated is just so um, immensely powerful. It's something that we spend a lot of time thinking about at the Office of Students, how we get that balance right and uh, how we factor in the um, legitimate expectations of universities and colleges that are so successful in so many ways. And yet, there is a power imbalance, however you look at it. Are students always getting high quality experience? The answer to that, to be honest, is no, not always. And so how do we get the balance right between being responsive to this hugely successful sector and yet making sure we're doing a job as an effective and tough and uh, pointy uh, regulator, to use Catherine's words. And Gina, you emphasize the need for dialogue and collaboration. Absolutely right. We just must carry on having this exercise because that's how we uh, make sure that we're making the most of principle-based regulation that it is responsive in that way. And then, Hilary, I have to finish with you because your contributions are just so helpful. You are the student. You are the, primarily what this is all about. We have to carry on listening to you and colleagues and making sure that uh, we don't just treat students as buyers. Of course, it's a much more complex relationship than that. And what it is that um, how we can define uh, success in the most broadest and inclusive way has to be core to our task. So look, um, a fantastic conversa conversation and discussion. Um, thank you all very much indeed uh, for your contributions. This discussion is going to continue long after this event has finished and I look forward to continuing it with you all. So thank you all very much and have a very good, a very good day.